Hey everyone, welcome to Res135. I'm your host, Callan, and today's lecture involves an inside look on the Waterloo Works process, especially the new changes with the system this year, and tips on how to tackle your upcoming job search. Then we'll take a deeper dive into a couple resumes critiqued live by our upper years and alums, and of course, ending off with a Q&A session. If you have any burning questions during our presentation, definitely raise your hand and ask by going to bit.ly slash uwcsclub dash res135 dash slider and we'll answer those questions during the Q&A. We've included a couple important links above and we'll talk about them throughout the event. If you want a sneak peek, be sure to check out techintern.io to help your external job search and bit.ly slash uwcsclub dash offline dash re review if you want our wonderful panel of CS Club execs and volunteers to help perfect your resume before the job application deadline. Without further ado, our first speaker, Gordon, will be presenting some job search tips you should know about. So bring out your notebooks, sharpen your pencils, class is now in session. Take it away, Gordon. Hello, hello. Thank you, Callan, for that wonderful intro. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna start with a little Waterloo Works review and kind of some tips on how to approach, I guess, this, um, this application cycle during this term, right? So. There is a new format, and I think this started last term, but in case you guys aren't familiar with it, I'm just gonna give you a quick summary in case you don't know. Um, I created this calendar on Google Calendar. You can actually access it and add it to your own calendar if you'd like. It's uh, bit.ly slash w21-ww-calendar, I believe. Um, and it should be in the Twitch chat. Someone spam it in, in the Twitch chat. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you guys wanna add this to your calendar, um, it just has the list of the deadlines for Waterloo Works. So I'll just get into it. Um, yeah, so now there are two main cycles. Uh, there's one before reading week and then one that starts during reading week. Each cycle um, is split into two different postings, um, which are basically rounds where jobs get posted, right? Uh, regardless of when the rounds open or when the posting rounds open, which is typically Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, they always close on Friday, okay? So that means by Saturday, all postings are going to be available, right? So a tip here is to wait until Saturday to apply. Uh, if you start applying like on the first day, it's not guaranteed that all the jobs are up. So uh, I, I think right now, if you're applying for like a CS job or a, like a Swede job or a technical job, um, there's over a thousand uh, available applications and you don't want to have to go through that thousand every time or like every day just to find the couple that are new. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend uh, waiting until Saturday. So do as much of your schoolwork as you can during the week, and then make sure you leave some room on the weekend uh, so you can sift through the applications and apply. Don't wait until the last minute. Applications are always due 9 a.m. on the Tuesday, the week after the postings open, okay? I know people that have missed this deadline. Do not miss this deadline. Don't apply Monday night. Waterloo Works has crashed before, and you do not want to be stressed out like that. So apply during the weekend and like aim to be done Sunday, okay? Um, like latest. Um, but yeah, so this is the first round, uh, the first cycle, I have it in purple. And then the interviews are the week, happened the week after the postings are done, right? These are like, this is just the time frame when interviews can happen. Pretty sure they're all remote. 
Um, and then once the interviews are done, oh, what's happening? Okay, once the interviews are done, uh, on the Thursday, rankings will be available at 2 p.m. You have 24 hours before your rankings are due, okay? Uh, and then the end of day on Friday is when you get your matches. Cycle two is pretty much the same thing as cycle one. Um, it'll open on the 16th of February uh, and on the 19th on Friday, it'll close. Um, like no new applications will be posted after that. So on the 20th, right? 20th, 21st, that's when you should apply. Um, and then applications, like I said, do 9 a.m. the next Tuesday. Second postings, interviews start due at 9 a.m., okay? Um, just like before, uh, the employer rankings will be released 2 p.m. on the Thursday. Uh, I, I think like a week or two after the, the postings and then rankings are due 24 hours later with matches happening by the end of the day, okay? Uh, now there's also a continuous uh, cycle that is basically, um, I added a note here, new jobs are posted every day and they stay live for two business days. So I think they're posted at 9 a.m. and they're available for two days until 9 a.m. Um, Eastern time, right? So, so during continuous, you'll want to be checking back pretty frequently. Um, interviews happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then rankings for that week will come out 8 p.m. on Thursday night, and then your rankings will be due 10 a.m. the next day. So you only have like 14 hours to, to submit these. So don't be late on that. If, if you're in this situation, then make sure you're constantly checking your email, constantly checking what all the works. All right. Um, yeah. And it continues until the last day of the term, uh, which is April 16th. Okay. So uh, what to look for when you're looking at a posting, right? There's like a bunch of jobs. You click on something you're interested. What do you want to focus on? So one thing is read the description. You really, really like a lot of people just don't do this. They see the title and they apply, read the description. Um, first off, it will tell you if it's remote or if it's uh, intending to be in person, right? This summer, I am aware that there are internships that uh, intend to be in, in, in person, right? Given like COVID and everything, it, it might change, but I think they should be having this clear in the, in the description, right? It'll have you, it'll fill you in also on key responsibilities of your job. Um, and really you can help gauge your interest based on that, right? Uh, next, check the duration. If you are applying for a four month co-op, do not apply for an eight month co-op. Um, if you're applying for an eight month co-op though, uh, I have seen and I have heard of people that uh, applied of like four month co-ops and then they're able to extend it after. The, the extension is much easier and companies are usually more open to doing that. But if a company is looking for an eight month co-op, uh, they will not appreciate it if, uh, if, if in the interview you're like, so I actually want this for four months, right? Um, just like kind of a respect thing. You don't want to have to be in that situation, right? Um, also, I forgot to mention this, but every single cycle or every single uh, posting round, you get an additional 50 applications. So you have a hell of a lot of applications, right? Like if you look at this calendar, here you have 50 applications. Here you get another 50. And then here is another 50 and it's cumulative. So by here, you have 150 total applications. Here you have 200 total applications. In continuous, I think you can go up to 500, right? So don't be shy. If, if, if you feel like, you're apply, like you'll run out of applications, you probably won't. There's a lot, there will be a lot. Um, and yeah, um, another tip, when you're applying for jobs, only apply to jobs that you want. Do not apply to a job that, like put yourself in a situation where they're handing you the offer, okay? If you don't wanna accept that offer, don't apply to that job. Uh, I know people that have applied to a job uh, that they weren't interested in at all. They just wanted to fill the 50, right? And then um, the interview happens, ranking happens, they get ranked. They get ranked like one, they get the offer, but they don't want it. And then foolishly, they rank it 10, thinking that they'll probably match elsewhere. And they don't match elsewhere. And then they end up getting the job that they don't want. And they have to have four months of, uh, I guess, a different experience than what they expected, right? So if you don't want a job and you get ranked for it, give it a no rank Um I think you should have three per term. Um, that's, that's what I had. Uh, but yeah, um, at the end of the day, do not apply to jobs that you don't want to take. Okay. Um, aside from Waterloo works, I really recommend that you apply externally. All right. External applications are super, super helpful. Um, they don't have, you know, a limit on the number of applications. So you can just apply everywhere and anywhere that you're interested. Um, personally, I've actually had a lot more luck applying externally, uh, through Waterloo works. I 
I, I haven't been able to find that many jobs, but externally, um, even applying to the same companies, right? Uh, I, I was able to have more success there. So it doesn't hurt you to apply externally. Um, it's a little more work, but I think it's definitely, definitely more worth it. Um, if you've applied externally to a company and they reject you, and then you see them on Waterloo Works, should you still apply? Yes. Yes, you should. It's basically a second chance. And since uh, this time you're given so many like applications, I, I definitely recommend it. Um, and the inverse is true. If you, if you apply to a company through Waterloo Works and they rejected you, uh, and still apply to them ex externally if, if you haven't. That actually, that same situation happened to me. I didn't get the interview through Waterloo Works, and then I applied on their own portal, and then I got the interview. So um, make sure you like try to maximize your chances of getting that interview. Um, yeah, I want to touch on cover letters. So cover letters are not the most useful. Uh, they take a lot of effort, so you should only write it for companies that, one, either require you to write one to apply, or two, if you're really genuinely interested in working for them. So like, if, if it's a big company, um, they most likely won't be looking at your resumes, uh, won't be looking at your cover letters just because they have so many applications, right? So uh, if you're really interested in working at Google or Facebook, uh, don't write them a cover letter. But if it's a smaller company and you're really genuinely interested in like the work they do, or you've just heard really great things about them, like, like basically you're not trying to work for them for the cloud. You're, you you want to work for them because, because you think they're a great company and you, and you really want to do like work for them. Then, then writing a cover letter is okay. Right. Uh, if you do write one, you should learn about the company. You should learn about what they're doing and you should try to tie that into your experience and interests. Do not do a generic cover letter where you just have like a insert company name here. Right. G generic intros can be okay, but the bulk of your res uh, of, of your cover letter should definitely be tailored. A bad cover letter is much worse than no cover letter. So make sure that if you do one, um, you get it read over, uh, you get your peers to read it over and, and that it's really tailored for that company and for that specific role, okay? Uh, lastly, I wanted to touch on the mindset that um, you should maybe have going into this. I know it's a really stressful time. I know it seems like sometimes the odds are stacked against you or they're not in your favor. And honestly, like that's life. You cannot avoid it, especially in this situation. My advice is to just keep putting the next foot forward. This is, this is definitely grind season. Uh, if you don't work hard, your chances of success will not be as high, right? Um, success uh, is made of two things. It's made of preparation and luck, all right? If you're prepared, then when you get lucky, you will succeed. You'll be able to capitalize on, on that opportunity. On the other hand, if you're lucky, but you're not prepared, you will not be able to take that opportunity and you'll miss out, all right? So you can only control one side of this. You can only, just, so you need to stay prepared. You need to keep on grinding, right? We'll be here. CS Club will be here to help you out however and whenever we can. So feel free to reach out, right? You can go to that resume, like offline resume critique uh, if, if you wanna get your resume critique there. Um, but yeah, uh, I just finished off. Good luck everyone on your applications. I know it's a tough time, but uh, I'm sure you guys will all do great. And I'm just going to pass it back uh, over to Callan. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Gordon. Um, yeah, those are wonderful tips. And I'll probably be using those tips myself for my own fall co-op search. Um, we'll now be taking a look at our resume review portion of the class. So we have Joe, who's going to be taking the time to review a few resumes sent to us. Um, we did have quite a bit of resumes, um, so we're not able to go through all of them, uh, but not to worry, we'll get to yours and we'll send, a, uh, send out reviews to you offline if we don't review it tonight. Um, anyways, Joe, take it away. <laughs> hey everyone, how's it going today? My name is Joe and I'm a third year student at the University of Waterloo studying CS. I'm currently working as a software engineering at a uh, tech firm in Waterloo called MioVision. Without further ado, let's get started with our first resume. So <laughs> this resume actually looks a lot like mine. I can tell, uh, I can tell you made it on latex and that's a, that's a good thing, right? I think what really stands out about this resume is that how everything is really nicely sectioned, right? I can just, you know, look at your skills and see your skills. I can look at your experience, see your experience. And this is really important uh, for getting your resume seen, you have to realize that, especially for big companies who get like 
hundreds and hundreds of resumes, they're not always going to take the time to read your entire resume in detail, right? So what they might end up doing is that they'll, you know, take a quick glance at a resume and filter it through different stages. So for example, if you're applying for a place that, you know, works with React a lot with a lot of front end, uh, they're going to take a look at your resume. They're going to look for JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and React. And you want to have those things uh, like sort of very clear so that they can see it. So this is, you know, this section is really nice. You got some good skills going on here. Uh, next, we have experience at large tech company. Now, I don't know how uh, large tech this tech company is. You know, if it's Apple or something, I don't think you have any problem getting a co-op. But if it isn't, I think looking at this uh, description, I don't know what you've done at your company, right? I know you've, you know, built some iOS applications and you've worked with other members of your team, but I don't know the impact of what your work actually is. So one of the things that people uh, in Waterloo do a lot for experience is that they like to have some sort of business value tied into their experience as well, right? So they want to they want to say, you know, the work I've done at uh, at this company was able to generate, you know, 10% increase in efficiency, uh, get 10% increase in leads and things along those lines. And if you've done some good work at, at this company, you should definitely take the opportunity to put that information there. Also, I'd like to talk about the uh, what, how, and why method. This is a little method that I like to do to make my resume points. So it starts with what, what you did, uh, how you did it, usually you know, by mentioning languages or technologies and the result is, and that's where you want to plug your, uh, your business value, right? So for example, uh, for this experience, you could write uh, developed uh, iOS applications and be a bit more specific about what type of applications they were, right? Um, how uh, using uh, Swift and maybe going into a bit more about the various application development methods, right? And the result, you know, uh, this, this, this application that I built is currently being used by 10,000 users or this application that I built currently has a 4.5 star rating on the app store. All these things help your resume stand out and definitely having, you know, a first high uh, first internship experience before university will go a lot in your favor. Something else I'd recommend is actually uh, omitting, omitting this line because it, it sort of, you sound a bit more credible and you sound, you know, uh, you've done a bit more work that rather than having it as like a pilot high school uh, co-op program. Moving on to the uh, projects, we have the trending stock proposal generator, the URL certainer, and the uh, timetable generator. This is all pretty good stuff. And I also really like how you put your various skills at the bottom. So in addition to having your skills at the really top, uh, at the top, right, or having a skill section in your resume, something else that is good is to highlight where you've used your skills. And this is definitely a good way to do that. Um, just taking a quick glance over these projects, developed a responsive full stack application. Developed a responsive full stack application. I, you should probably have different things to describe what those two projects are and probably go into a little more in depth about how you build these projects, right? People care, uh, people care about you know, two main things, the technical side and also the business value, for, uh, business value of it. So you should definitely take the time to explore that. Um, for example, also with the timetable generator, right? You talked about um, how it's being used by 900 students, right? It sounds like this is actually being used in your school. And if it is, that's great, that's amazing, right? but it's not apparently clear that your school administration is using it. So if they are, you definitely want to uh, make it very clear to the person reading your resumes. Remember, the person reading your resume is not gonna go through every single line, read everything in detail. They will be skimming through it and taking quick glances. So you want to make sure that your important things pop out. Uh, next, we have achievements. Hey, good job. Uh, University of Waterloo, yep, pretty standard stuff. Um, just a quick note about relevant coursework. This stuff becomes less uh, less important uh, in your in your future years. So if you have more points to add about your projects, more points uh, a future experience, and looking for something to cut, you can probably uh, um, uh, probably remove this line in your future resumes.
So, so far, a pretty good first resume. Again, big fan of a look. Uh, let's move on to our second one. So, all right, name goes here. So again, very similar, very similar style. They got the skills, projects, experiences, education, and awards. So this skill section is a bit small, right? You want the skill section to be a bit bigger. If it's, you know, only a few things, it might, you might want to omit it and put more word, uh, put more stuff in your project and experiences. However, I think, you know, it, you can definitely expand this as well because you use things like Java Swing, you use uh, TK Enter. These, you know, technologies, right? You can also add them under relevant skills, like skills and technology section. That's going to do, that's going to help employers see what type of skills you have. Uh, next up, projects. High pixel skyblock calculator. Oh man, I'm, <laughs> I play Minecraft myself, so big fan. Good stuff right here. So if this is actually being used by the high pixel community, you should definitely, you know, plug those metrics in there, right? You know, it's, it's currently being used by X number of people. It's being used on the server. People care about business values. Startups love seeing people who, you know, done stuff. So definitely have those business value there as well. Student registration, pretty standard. Calculator app, pretty standard. These seems like small projects that you use to, you know, uh, start learning a language. Um, definitely, you can uh, consider uh, having, you know, more advanced, more customized projects as you as you grow in your technical skills in the future and replace them. But having them here right now, not a problem. Experience, mathematical tutor, upper primary, and intern. So, something about cultural context, right? Um, maybe upper primary, you know, has has the meaning uh, from like where you're from, but you have to keep in mind that the person who's reading your resume, they might not understand what upper primary is, and it might be a good idea to admit it just to you know avoid avoid confusion. Other than that, you know you show that you work with people. That's pretty good stuff. Uh, intern, so software at a software company. So I don't know if you had a software like intern position. If you did, I definitely think it's a good idea to change the title to like a software intern or a software developer, just so it's more clear to people what you've done. Uh, if if you didn't, I still think it's you know uh, worth your time changing the title to something that's a bit more descriptive than intern to have a good idea of what you've done. Um, if you've done anything technical, definitely mention here. And if you haven't, that's fine. Um, helped create a Jogit project for managing company-wide databases. Expand that a bit more. Um, I like to know what role you've played in the project, right? Saying things like we did this or I helped do this, it sort of muddies the water. I, th the recruiter won't know what exactly your contribution is for this, right? So you should definitely make that clear. And then created a comprehensive user guide for mobile applications. So if, how do I put this? As a developer, you work with people and your product is for people, right? One of the things that you have to do is you have to consider the end user in mind when you're designing your uh, when you're designing whatever application you're using. So you can actually use this as a good opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about how you built the user guide and also how you kept about how you kept the end user in mind, and that might sh uh, that might show some initiative on your side. Uh, moving on to education. Enriched math courses, I'm impressed. Faculty of Mathematics Global Scholarship, good stuff. Damn, look at that, 9.3% GPA in first in first year. You guys are putting me to shame. I, <laughs> my average was nowhere close to that at all. So congrats, man, great job. Ah, next up we have Cambridge GCE, A-levels. Um, so if you have more room, if you want more room to add stuff in, generally high school stuff isn't as important when you uh, go into university. So it might be uh, a good idea to admit this if you want to add if you want if you want to add more of your experiences on a roll. Oh man, perfect score! What a flex! Top fifty percentile. All good stuff, man. All all solid awards. I can see you're a really smart guy off of this. Playing piano, trombone. I, I played piano when I was a kid as well. Yep, yep. Uh, curator at your school's uh, TEDx. So I actually had my school's TEDx uh, on my uh, 
resume and my first year resume. And instead of putting it as like a few point, I actually wrote it like a full on project, right? Because it was, you know, a big, it was a big event. I wrote about how many people are attended, what my role was, right? You know, the, like how many people actually viewed, view, viewed the TEDx talk. I think that's actually a good opportunity, right? If you want, you I definitely think you should, you know, write about how many people came about and a little bit more specific about your events and responsibilities. Remember, having numbers def, uh, is a good idea. So, third resume. All right. Okay, yeah, pretty good stuff. Work experience. Build a, hmm. yeah. So, um, similar advice to the previous resumes, right? Especially when you have, you know, uh, work experience. You want to talk not, not only about the technical stuff you've done, but also about your business impact, right? So if you've built a registration app, I want to know, you know, is it internal, external, is it used inside a company or outside of a company? How many people are using it, right? Um, if this form has gotten signups, you can take credit for that, right? You know, I've built this form, it got the company, uh, you know, 200 more people, 10% more people. That's great stuff. Companies want to see that, right? And again, using the what, how and why method. So create a React app, uh, uh, created a registration form app using React and talk about, you know, the results for it. All very good stuff. Uh, researched about, you know, autonomous vehicles and created a website. Same thing, you know, expanding more on that, talking more about the business impact. And this one, right, uh, building a user interface, uh, redesigning it. Uh, when it comes to redesign, it means that you've most likely worked with a team of other people, you got some feedback, and that's something that you should be mentioning there as well, right? You work with a team of not only other developers, but project managers, designers, you talk to people outside your team when you're working in a tech firm. That's something, definitely something that you want to show. Uh, next up, side projects, extracurriculars, and e-commerce sites uh, built using VS Code, using all of that. Okay. That's a lot of things. Um, this, if you have this much skills, you should definitely put a skill section on top, right? It lets the uh, lets the hiring manager just take a quick look at your resume and see what skills you have. You definitely have a good bunch of skills, right? And then over here, you implemented multiple features to enhance user experience, so on and so forth. So I would actually recommend you uh, rewrite the section using the what, how, and why method, right? So you can talk about each separate component, right? Uh, built the user authentication uh, authentication portion using, let's say, MongoDB, for example, and talk about you know how many users that has. Definitely break it up. It makes it more readable. It also makes it um, makes me more aware of the impact that this website has, that, that, that this website has. It's definitely, you know, uh, definitely a great thing that you've done here, especially with all these technologies, right? Something to note, um, VS Code clips here as well. You don't really want to, it doesn't really matter what IDE you use. You could have simply built it with uh, IntelliJ or another IDE. IDE are usually inter interchangeable. Most workplaces, they don't really care which IDE you use. So it's something that, you know, it's not a technical skill that you want to showcase. And something else, just uh, taking a quick look at the uh, bolding stuff, right? So one of the reasons why people bold stuff on their resume is to uh, help it stand out to the to the person who's reading your resume. But you've bolded, I think, in my opinion, a bit too much stuff here, right? And when you have all these stuff bolded, it sort of muddies the water and it makes it a bit harder for people to sort of know exactly what they should be focusing on, right? So I would suggest you, you know, choose one main thing to bold on, right? For, I would probably choose, you know, languages to bold on and not bold the other stuff. Um, yeah, and if you're wondering, you know, since since I suggested you, you build a skill section, you're wondering where do I pull room out of it? I would definitely um, tr uh, consider like omitting some of the stuff at the bottom, the student council, the high school stuff, right? Like those things show that, you know, you've done good work, you have numbers there as well, but it might not be as important. Uh, it might be more worthwhile for you to have a skill section compared to that. Analyzing heart disease patients, pretty center stuff, pretty good stuff. The tech solution for the mixed misdiagnosis of diabetes. If you're pitching it and if you're building a technical solution, 
should definitely talk about a clinical solution in some sort. Even if it's like still being a prototype, you can still talk about, you know, the prototype that you're building. This is like something that's interesting, right? And I can see you being asked about that on your interview. Awards and certificates, pretty good stuff. Um, you probably won't be asked to perform CPR at work. So I think you can, uh, if you know, it's it, it shows that you have skills, but if you need more space, you can definitely consider omitting that. Oh man, 4.0 greater than 95%. I have no idea how you do that. I, I can't. <laughs> oh man. You guys, honestly, these resumes are all better than my first year resume. So don't worry, guys. Just, you know, get the applications out. I think you'll be fine. I think that's all for me. So back to you, Callan. Awesome. Thank you. Damn, you guys have some pretty amazing resumes this year. Much better than my first year resume, I'll give you that. Um, next up, we have Kyle, who was a Waterloo alum and will be giving us a resume critique perspective from someone in the tech industry who has been working with various companies to hire new talent. But I'll let him introduce himself. Kyle, everyone. Okay, hello, hello. So nice to meet you guys. My name is Kyle with the Public Q. I graduated from SIDE back last year, uh, last year in May, and I'm currently working on techintern.io, which is an internship posting system that is geared towards tech. You can think of it basically as Waterloo Works, but not exclusively for Waterloo students. So some of the, my past co-op experiences <laughs> include stints at LeafLink, Uber, and Hypotenuse Labs. So I've done everything from the co-op grind to digital nomading twice as an intern. So if you have questions for that, let me know. So hopefully you guys can see the resume now. Um, I guess starting things, starting things off uh, with the actual high level overview of the structure. So from the top down, it looks like there's a lot of content going on here. And it really shows that you have plenty of experience and your projects, uh, you have projects and you have awards. The, I think the uh, immediate impression I have of this resume is that you probably want to let a lot of, more of the content breathe rather than having things all jammed together where you don't, every point individually doesn't have the chance to make as much of an impact, <clears throat> of an impact. So oh, I'll get, talk a bit more about that when I get to the actual, actual content themselves. So from the top down, you start off with exper experience and the first point is youth hacks where you are an organizer. I think for uh, when I was reading over this point initially, my impression was that I know that you're an organizer, but I don't know what your impact was or what you did as your role. Yeah, as your role. Did you help organize all of the events? Did you get all the speakers there? Did you get all the sponsorship or the workshops? And, or how many people attended? Or how many people did you uh, try to market to? And how many people actually, uh, actually uh, used ev events that were directly hosted by you? So I think, I think if anything, if anything, your points could stand. Uh, your point does have a lot hiding here, especially because you're working on it right now. That you could elaborate on to make it a better case for the, uh, the hiring managers and recruiters. For the next up, uh, next up, you have facts and research, uh, research systems, which I think your first point, where you have four members, uh, fourteen members, and seven pages, is fantastic because it showcases not only that you're working in a cross-disciplinary team or a team that was working with the clients, and you were also building a set concrete amount of pages that I quant you can quantify, so I know exactly how much you were working on. Okay, one. Aside from that, I think your other points could stand to uh, could stand to have a little bit more context for helping me understand exactly how important your work is, because you won sec uh, you won second place out of sixteen teams, but it doesn't tell me what the competition was based on. Uh, was based on was the judging criteria the number of people that was you were able to reach? Was it number of uh, was it how well programmed it was, or the code review system that you had to go through, so on and so forth. And with the third point of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you could probably, uh, with React, you can probably include that as part of your first point to give it more context because uh, context because saying it's better to, in general, show that you did something and put the skills in context rather than just say just saying that I learned this and therefore I know this. Well, this as visual proof. Moving on to Google Code, in you have two uh, two projects that you contributed to here. Uh, and I think that's great. And it shows that you have a uh, you have experience contributing code on a, a usable production level. 
However, I'd want to know how large your contributions were and what kind of review process you were actually going through because these things help me, are big, big indicators to help to show me what kind of code you are working, are working on and whether it meets the criteria to be used in, in industry level systems. The systems. And then next up for registered users as a co-founder, it's I, you have the 300 bolded, which is fantastic. And you've mentioned that you built a website. A website. Here, I, you're answering the right question of how much impact you have on how many people. But I'd, I think you can go one step further to really talk about how you did this and how your skills with the website, uh, website and how the way you built it really affected that change and positive impacts to the 300 refugees that you're talking about. Did you help them find shelter, food, or, or help organizers work with them, so on and so forth. And the last experience point is Pace University. And where you say, where you mentioned that you use Python to impact the Billion Oyster project. And I think this point is fantastic. And I really think you have a lot of chance opportunities to elaborate on this in a meaningful way, because there's, uh, because you have a real world impact that is used by an organization beyond yourself, where you can mention how effective was your, were your results? Did your results, um, were the depths that were calculated by your programs much more effective than those that were being used also otherwise? And that would be a great way of showcasing that you had, you worked on something not only with technical value and being impressive that, with that, but also business value that, that is helping your organizations accomplish goals meaningfully. Moving on to your projects here, I think, as I said in the, in the high level overview, it's really hard to read all your points at once. Uh, like for example, the one, uh, one project that really sticks out to me here is your Dr. Racket autocomplete package because you have that, the point where it's being used by over 700 students. However, it's hard for me to pick that out from the paragraphs you have. So I recommend you let your points breathe a little more and stand alone so they don't cover each other. Each other. Um, for while the reviewer is trying to skim through things. Next up is the programming skills and your awards. Your skills look totally fine, uh, look totally fine no problems here. For, and then for your awards, same problem with the projects where it's very much in a bundle. A bundle. I think you can definitely remove some of the more, uh, some of the, um, more popular ones, for example, the President's Scholarship Distinction in favor of your more unique highlights, which is like three-time New York City table tennis varsity champion. That, and that would help you make their points stronger and also get noticed for things that make you distinctive, which is something that any hiring manager is always going to be looking for. Looking for. For extra curriculars, uh, curriculars looks fine. And your education, I think you're, I think you're probably able to remove high school very safely because from what it looks like, you have a lot of great content that you could be elaborating on in the experience section, whereas your high school uh, high school work is not as relevant uh, now in your university studies. Overall, I think, your, uh, I think your resume is fantastic and you're suffering from the enviable problem of too much content rather than too little content, uh, little content. So I think you can use that to your advantage all greatly. Cool, so moving on to the next resume, if I can get it open is, aha, here. So now, if you guys can see it, I uh, going over a top level overview again, and we have skills, experiences, projects, awards, education, and a little bit of space where I assume you put your name uh, in at the bottom after being redacted, and everything looks great. Uh, honestly, no real complaints. Everything you have, you're bowling things consistently over the resume, so I can skim through things. You have your content is highlighted in a way that I can skim through it easily. Easily, everything looks great. Hey, from the top level. So now going to the actual content, I think for your skill uh, for your skills, uh, you have a lot of white space on your right side. So if you wanted to compress the resume to add in more content later on, you could move, combine your front end and back end section as well as your languages and tool section to be together, so that you, it takes up two lines rather than four. And that's just a small uh, uh, it's a small little thing you could do if you want to put more things on. For your experiences, you have two experiences, which are your uh, instructional support apprentice uh, at UW, as well as your current opportunity from January 2021, which is your TA position. 
I really, really like your first point in your ISA section where you highlight not only that you had 850 plus submissions, but also 30 reduced the time marking for assignments by 30%. Both are very actionable, uh, um, very contextualized. Uh, so I understand immediately how impactful your actions were, as well as in how, in how effective your changes are, are in a business sense. I think where you could make your section stronger is to talk about the business, uh, not only just the business value, but also the technical chops that you had to, uh, had to have in order to demonstrate your abilities. Uh, abilities, Because for example, with your second point, you say that you learn Linux commands by managing the course repositories in shell. And that is a great starting point, but I think, think that it's, it's always better to show rather than tell uh, until so you could expand on this point by saying that you uh, that you use Linux commands to manage the course repositories, leading to, for example, a decrease of twenty percent in time to reach files for students, and that would be a much more actionable point for me to, me to keep in mind. Uh, other than that, I think having more uh, or metrics that you, you could talk about for how many hours you uh, you, uh, you office hours you were actually running or how many students you were helping at once in your, class, uh, in your classes, and also whether your instruction had a noticeable impact between the people who went to your office hours and the ones who didn't, or the ones between your section and, uh, and office uh, TA a, um, tutorials versus the ones who went to a different tutorial. And that could be a measurement of how effective a communicator you are. Uh, yeah, and for your TA position, I think that you met explicitly is from January 2021, so you just started it. So I think what you have here is perfectly fine. So, and going forward as the term progresses, you definitely can add in more things that might you think might be relevant by shortening up a little bit of the rest of your resume, uh, resume. and you definitely have space for that. Cool. So moving on to projects. So you where you have straights and smart brain, uh, uh, brain. I think what you have here is a great start in terms of telling me what exactly each project does because your descriptions are very, very clear. And uh, however, I, th I think as I mentioned earlier with the show not tell, it's telling me a lot about how you learn something or you uh, learn something or you use, uh, use something on a very introductory level. So I think that, I think that how you could uh, make your points stronger overall is to put your projects in front of your friends and get them to test the things that you built and then put that on your resume. For example, if you get 10 friends to test, uh, to try out your card game, you could say test, uh, uh, you could say tested with 10 plus, us uh, plus users over the course of a week, a week. And that is important for showcasing that you have initiative and that you, uh, it also implies that because users are actually, uh, actually giving you feedback and constant uh, uh, feedback to evolve your product, it shows that you are thinking of things on a, uh, on a more holistic level, which a lot of employers really, really appreciate, particularly startups, which who I'm more familiar with. Anyways, it's also one, on the easier side, one of the quicker things that you can do to improve your resume right now if you, if you choose to. Cool. So moving on to, uh, on from there onto your awards where you have Euclid, which is very clear, top 15%, very, very nice. And the Gold Duke of Edinburgh award recipient. Here, I think your resume, uh, uh, your resume is, uh, you could use a similar, uh, similar context, uh, a way of displaying context as you did with the Euclid, where I want to know how impressive this is. I know you mentioned in, in your first point that you were, uh, you were presented at, at the Buckingham Palace like award ceremony by a member of the royal family, but so that is that doesn't tell me exactly how many people you were competing with because it could be that you could have been competing with about hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, or hundred thousand plus, or all the UK for in that instance, and that would only help you in terms of measuring how great that achievement is. And for your for the next point, uh, next point of volunteering at the backstage South Expedition or uh, going on the expedition to Dartmoor. For your South Expedition, I would challenge you to add more information on how many shows you're running, uh, you're running or how, much, how many people were you communicating with to facilitate the communication skills to really showcase things in a measurable practical way. For the expedition, 
I feel like this one is one where I personally don't know enough about what Dar what an expedition to Dartmoor actually entails, and I'm, I'm not sure how many of your resume reviewers will will be the same as me. So you could probably either add more information on what that is, or you could decrease, uh, or you could uh, shorten that up a little bit more or more and remove it in favor of other content. Yep, education pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. I think you could. Uh, I think what you have here is fine. If anything, you could probably remove relevant coursework, yeah, coursework if you want to add more content, for example, with your TA position. But overall, great job. Cool. So moving on to the next resume. Next up, we have a last resume on my list. Uh, let's start off from an overview. We have skills, education, work experience, projects, extracurriculars, and everything here looks solid. Uh, looks solid. I don't have any any complaints about the skimming. Everything the project looks format well formatted. No real redundancies here. Uh, here, well done. For the actual body of the uh, body of the resume skills, I would recommend you. Uh, I would recommend the only thing is remove Rust because that's, that's more of a design framework rather than a tool. So you could probably, uh, but other than that, everything looks okay. For education, pretty standard. Pretty standard. Same comment about the relevant courses. It's probably not as necessary if you want to add more, and you could probably cut it in favor of more content on your work experience for projects. Uh, projects. So that's all. That's really about it. it. Other than that, you could probably trip up the white space a little bit if you wanted to. For work experience, you have full stack and a developer and or at the company in Toronto and a remote experience that is based in Waterloo. So I think on your full stack experience uh, in here, the important thing that uh, uh, that I'm missing in terms of information is how did what you do impact the business goals in meaningful ways? So that could because you're telling me what you did and that, uh, what you did, for example, using React and Redux, but I'm not understanding how large of a contribution you actually made to the business. Because if you built components that were used by uh, used in 100 pages by uh, 100 pages by on a website that was built uh, to support 10,000 plus users per day, that's very different than building one component or two components for a page that is only run by two users per hour. So that's something to keep in mind, yeah, keep in mind. Same with your MongoDB schema design. If you wanted to you put some information on how your version history uh, history either save money or reduce downtime or reduce backup time or so forth, that could be really interesting. Uh, really interesting to talk about in an interview as well. Uh, for, Apollo, uh, for Apollo with endpoints to technical MongoDB, if you were, I think the best thing you could do here is tell, uh, is talk about how often these points were being used, and and whether you had any considerations for latency or downtime, uh, downtime or mostly database support or anything that might be able to help you with the technical impressiveness and business, uh, business value here. So that is something. Uh, so that's something for your first section, which I think you already implemented really well in the first point of your software developer experience, uh, Aaron's, where you say that you use React and Redux to save 20 hours uh, hours a week for uh, a week by for the content team, where that's really really good, and I think you should be doing more of that because 20 hours plus per week tells me that in two weeks you'll have saved the uh, saved enough work hours for one person's full work week, 40 hours a week, right? And that gives me a really good idea of how impressive the thing you did, uh, the things you did were, and uh, not only in terms of business value but also technical accomplishment. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. I would challenge you to move uh, to use that same kind of measuring uh, system in your second uh, other points. For example, for code maintainability and readability, how much of the the code base were you working with? Did, uh, working with, and did you reduce the amount of occurrences of bugs by either tickets that were or, or that were formed later, or the number of bugs that were reported in general? In general, um, for and for the last point here for migrated code base, I would want. I was curious what the distinction was between, uh, uh, especially what you did, because if you did the designs yourself and then implemented them with Material UI. That is one thing that you should talk about extensively. Or if you had designs from a designer that worked a designer elsewhere, and then you, you revamped those to work with the material UI, uh, material UI uh, for the entire code base and made that extensible, that's also another, another. And I want you to specify this because it would give me a much better idea as a recruiting manager of what kind of skills you're working with here and what uh, and how large your impact was. Cool. 
So moving on to projects, uh, uh, projects, you have three projects, and I I really like that you have metrics where you can you can for them. For example, for your IPL match prediction, you have achieved an accuracy of eighty four percent. Really fantastic, uh, fantastic. I think that you could definitely use the same kind of measuring system for my stocks. For example, uh, for example, uh, if you're predicting the stock movement direction with relevant information, how effective was that? Uh, is that and what kind of scale were you using to serve these things and making sure that these testing uh, testing this actually worked well and these things were rele relevant? Or for what copter or what was the latency like and did the software that we were building help control it within so, uh, with stable periods uh, as well enough with control of only it. You could also use, if you want more points with more measurable impacts as well, that would help things be stronger. You could also try and put it your put your tools and projects in front of stu other students or your friends to get them to test it, uh, test it. Because at least from my personal experience uh, and the effective a lot of recruiting managers have talked about, for almost all cases, any uh, uh, most projects that have been tested by people are more impressive than ones that haven't because it shows you're willing to uh, willing to take feedback, you're willing to uh, to break things and make things better, and you're uh, and you're trying to engage the top product on the entire level, that level. So that's just a, a suggestion if you wanted to do that. Extracurricular curriculars, I think everything you have is great. You have 80 plus members of five schools, 70 plus people uh, people present implementations. Everything's here is fine. Uh, fine, no real comments. I like your metrics. I like your statements of what you did. Um, and yeah, overall, great job on the resume. Uh, on the resume. Uh, resume. I think you have a lot you could be talking about uh, talking about that could really help boost you to the next level with just with what you have right now. And hope, good luck with the job hunt. And I think that covers it for me. Back to you, Callan. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for all the amazing tips. I really like the tip about showing your projects to your network to get some user experience feedback and then testing metrics, which then you can display on your resume. But all the tips, amazing. So great, that about sums up our main event. Um, we're now gonna move on to the Q&A. So if you haven't already, check out the Slido link above and add your questions. Um, I'll go through some of them now and our entire panel can answer them. Um, so the first question uh, is, I know that we, we should em emphasize the impacts of the stuff we made, but what if the app or website um, was not released to the public or it didn't make any impact slash, I don't exactly have metrics, what do I do? Uh, I guess I can take, the, take this one if no one else, else has anything. Um, I think that I think that it's a definitely a really hard position uh, position to be in if what you're ha what you're building doesn't have any measure uh, uh, you can't either openly say the metrics or you don't have the, don't have them. Um, for example, for some of my co-ops, I had NDA I had NDAs where it really restricted me from saying some, uh, saying things. But from my experience, I think there's uh, there's always something else that you could be uh, that you could be framing your point within to really make it stand out a bit more a bit more maybe if not technically but on a business level. For example, for example, uh, what, at my co-op at Uber, I was working on a I was working on pretty sensitive systems uh, since the systems would regards to team uh, with rider safety. So one of the things that I had to talk about uh, I had to one of the challenges I faced with later co-ops was how do I talk about this in a way I, I can't use metrics, uh, metrics, but I can, uh, but I can talk about uh, oh, still being impressive. So what I did was I talked about the cross team communications I, ha I had as one of my forefront. I wrote about the documentation, number of documentation and posts that I made, or I even, or I just vaguely expressed that I used Go and React uh, and Java to work with these backend systems, uh, systems using new technologies and uh, technologies for these uh, for these ways were positions where I couldn't really talk about the numbers. So I think it's definitely a challenge, but I, there are, if you can't find numbers for one technical accomplishment, there are going to be numbers for other, for other ones, even if you have to napkin math and estimate it. Perfect, okay. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, a classic. So, what are your preferences on one or two column resumes? Uh, anyone can answer this. <laughs> so, uh, my understanding is that a two column resume 
does not parse as well as a one column resume. So I guess it really depends on uh, where you're applying for. If you're applying for places that are, you know, big companies that are more likely to parse you, maybe just stick with the one column resume. Um, although it really depends on the design, it's a personal, personal choice. Kellen, back to you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, so, okay, this is a, um, a very upvoted question. Um, and I think it might be useful for all of us to talk on it. Um, the question is, could you speak on your experiences during your first co-op search? Um, they're also asking how many interviews and offers did you get during each round, if you wanted to disclose. <laughs> I can, I can, uh, I guess, share my experience on on uh, my first term of applying. Uh, so yeah, I remember this was back in 2018, I guess. Yeah, my one B term was when I started applying. Um, in the first round, I want to say, like in the main round, I I want to say I had maybe four to five interviews, um, just spanned out over like the the entire time. Uh, I did fill out like the full 50 applications and all that. And I thought like at least for two of the companies, one in particular, uh, but I thought the interviews went really well and I kind of went into it like almost expecting a rank. <laughs> um, and then, and then it happened like, and then rankings came out and I got, I got, I got no ranked and I was kind of shocked. I don't know. Uh, it was my first time going through like a lot of the works and stuff. So um I felt really confident, but apparently this is something that happens a lot. Like you'll feel really confident about something. You get a little overconfident and then you expect something to happen and it doesn't necessarily happen. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up going into continuous and then in continuous uh, within the first week, I went from 50 applications to I think 200 and like 30 or 280, something like that. Uh, so I, I applied a lot in, uh, in, in continuous. And then the first two weeks of continuous, I got maybe like another six interviews um and i got two offers from from that uh i ended up getting a like full stack uh dev role in in a small company in waterloo um but yeah uh i i, I guess the things to take away here is 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 apply um volume definitely helps i think that the 200 plus applications i i put in at the beginning of continuous was the reason i was able to get like you know that the handful of um, interviews that I had. So that was pretty much my first, uh, I guess, co-op experience. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, okay, moving on. Another question that we have is uh, what format, I'm assuming format of resume, should we be using if we have absolutely no work experience? Uh, I can take this if uh, no one else has anything they want to share. Um, yeah, so if you have absolutely no experience, then it'll be difficult, right, to fill out a resume, like a full page on, on a resume. I also had this problem um, when I was applying. Uh, something that I would recommend is to do literally anything to put on your resume right now. Uh, you could, if, if you're applying this is only applicable for, I guess, if you're applying for like a software developer type role, um, or like a technical role. Um, what, what I did was I went online, I went on, actually, I went on YouTube and <laughs> I don't know why I went on YouTube, but I went on YouTube and I watched like this four part series on how to build a website using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's it. Um, and then I literally copied almost line for line. I changed like, you know, the background color because I didn't like the one he used. So I used the one I liked. Uh, and I changed the name to you know, Gordon Lee in, in, instead of whatever his name was. And within like three days, I, I just like watched those videos, made the thing, put it on GitHub. Um, I, I was able to have my own like personal website, which counts as, as a project. Um, and, and that was how I think uh, I was able to get interviews, literally just based off of that one thing, right? Um, I was also, uh, during high school, I worked as like a lifeguard. So I put that on my resume. I had volunteered um, at a couple of different places. So I put that on my resume. Um, like if, if you have these experiences as, as well, they can definitely help to fill out 
your resume, um, e even if it aren't, isn't like extremely technical, uh, you can share kind of uh, the fact that, you know, you're, uh, you're involved in your community and you have like developed these interpersonal skills and these communication skills through these experiences and all that is helpful, right? Um, it's definitely better than having like a half empty resume. You, you don't want to submit something that like has like a lot of white space on the top and the bottom. You want to try to fill it in as much as you can, even if you feel like it's not always relevant. Um, it's, it's better than having white space for sure. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Um, but yeah, basically, if you don't have anything technical right now, I'd recommend um, maybe spending like this, this upcoming weekend or, 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 or something following some online course or um, like something where it's not necessarily your work and you're kind of following along, but you could still add that as a project. And then in the interview, you could explain your interest and how you intend to, you know, expand upon that later. But hopefully you get to the interview, right? That's the goal. Um, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, this is a very specific one. So how do I categorize skills? Right now I have software including languages uh, e.g. Java and markup, um, HTML, SQL, and I also have technologies such as React and Firebase. What's what's the best way to categorize the, the skills on a resume? I can take this one, I guess. Um, really, the really uh, resume uh, skills categorizations are not terribly useful overall. Uh, overall, beyond just being a way for a uh, way for the recruiters to really glance at your skills, uh, your skills, because the majority of the time for a lot of larger companies, they'll just be used to feed into a keyword search that will categorize your resume for later on, uh, later on. But to answer your question on how to categorize effectively, I think whatever, put your strongest skills up first, uh, up first near the front of, uh, of each line and whatever, uh, whatever format you think is necessary to fit all the skills you're relatively proficient in should be enough. Uh, I personally, it kind of can the skills uh, like this the direct skill section on my own resume in favor of just listing the actual words like Python, uh, uh, Python, SQL, uh, SQL, Flask, Django, right underneath my name at the top of my resume, uh, resume that uh, like under like the border, and that's kind of worked for me. Awesome, thanks. Um, another question. Uh, if I make something really terrific, why would employers necessarily care about how many end users see it? I know it sounds kind of obvious, but still. <laughs> uh, I think I want to take this one <laughs> for a double whammy. Um, I think the employers really care about uh, how effective your features are, because if they don't have the context of how many people are seeing, uh, seeing what you're building, they don't know what kind of standards being held up to. If, if I had a, uh, a res React component that I built that was being put for just a small wiki component that was, it would be seen by one person every year, that is, I can just write things, uh, write things a little, with a little bit more laxity. Whereas if I was building a login component that was having to fulfill 10,000 login requests per hour or per hour over, uh, over the course of a year, I need to bulletproof that code to the point where it will almost never fail uh, or fail, and that the impact of that is significant. Uh, significant because it's not just about what you did. Uh, the, the value that in your work is not only about what you did, but also making sure that your work is uh, is trustworthy, so that other people don't have to worry about your work all the time. That's the unseen value of the things that you write as a software engineer, in particular. So, in particular, so the user. Uh, how many things you see your how many people, users your work is being put in front of is a good indicator of how trustworthy can, uh, and how much reliability can I put on this person? Awesome. Okay, um, we're running a little short on time, ready over. So we'll finish it off with one more question. Um, I think this is a pretty important one. Um, how should I deal with jealousy slash envy when it seems like everyone else is getting great jobs and I am not? I'll take this one. Feels like a personal question. Um, I'm jealous of a lot of my peers. I'm jealous of the other people that are in this call with me right now because they are, you know, they're doing great for themselves and I'm still trying to figure things out. Um, main advice, two things. I think you have to realize that you're comparing your behind the scenes to their highlight reel. 
they definitely put in a lot of work that was not fun, that was not glamorous. There might have been some work that, you know, didn't that went unawarded. And you have to put that work in there yourself if you want to get to where they are. Um, I think when I get jealous of my peers, I, you know, realize that they've done a lot of work that I don't see to get where they are. And I'll have to put that work in as well. You know, usually if I'm jealous of someone, I ask them for resume advice. <laughs> yeah, I think to add on to this, it's also like, I don't think it's very conducive. I guess like, obviously we know that like jealousy is not great and it's, it's just, it's not fun to deal with, but I think molding it into something that you can work with, like if you do want to get somewhere, then try to see how you can do that in your own life and try to actually like work towards it. Like use your anger or jealousy to fuel like your future actions um, and try to move forward because everyone doesn't have the same path, um, but you know, you try to make the most of it and the harder you work, the more likely you'll probably get there. Um, yeah, anyone else have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, I could also add a little bit. This is a pretty pretty uh, big question. And it's a pretty big topic that I feel like uh, all CS students ex experience. Um, yeah, I have, I actually have some friends that are very, very talented developers, right? I'm in fourth year now. Um, and these, these people that I know, uh, like, I'm always in group chats with them and stuff. And they're always talking about, like, the latest project that they're doing, like, maybe like, tech trends that they're learning, or like this new, like, article that was published, and they're really, like, involved and motivated. And they're really, really talented. But um, I like, they haven't necessarily gotten like the, the, the super clout jobs or like the, the jobs that everyone think is like super, that every, everyone thinks are, 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 are super um, like at, at the top of like top tier, right? Um, and I think to an extent, they also uh, sometimes feel like maybe they deserve it more than other people. But at the end of the day, you have to realize that um, a company could get like 10,000 resumes, right? And um, if, their eyes like if, if yours doesn't stand out it might not necessarily because yours isn't good it might just be because there's so much volume and sometimes yours will be missed right uh, so there is a component of, of of luck and and there is a component of of let's like putting in all this work right so like what i said earlier about um staying prepared and then waiting for that lucky break uh, that lucky break is is, is when an, a, a rec recruiter or an engineering manager or whoever looks at the resumes uh, sees your name and then sees your resume and then has that little peak of interest and then puts it in the I will look at this again pile right um, that's that's the moment of luck you're waiting for and 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 then if you're prepared they'll see your resume they'll be impressed and then they'll interview you and then it's really up to you if you're able to impress them then you'll get the job right so um, I I view it like it's not really like a as much of a team game as it is like a solo game so you can't really blame anyone else except for yourself right um, so you just need to keep grinding. Um, jealousy is a tough thing to deal with for sure, but I think having a positive mindset and uh, kind of cheering everyone on uh, will get you further than, than staying jealous. So yeah, <laughs> that's it for me. Agreed on that. I just like one, uh, I just have like last thing to add on that one. Uh, I think the other important thing about this one is that you want to you want to be careful with what you're what you're enshrining with your goals uh, with your goals because for me I really fell into the Calier bus trend when I was in first year uh, first year I really suffered for that because uh, I suffered for that because I was applying for things that were way outside my skill level and being crushed when I didn't have it and have it and I was being jealous of the people who did uh, who did and I think like a, a lot of that came uh, from the idea that uh, this like California we're getting a job is like the way to success that will make me like more content where in reality, I, there was like a lot more that I didn't really consider and glossed over when I really shouldn't, so, I shouldn't. So it took me a lot of time to really think about what I found fulfilling before, uh, fulfilling uh, to, and what my own goals were rather than the goals that Waterloo make kind of enshrines in all the co-op students, uh, students here. So uh, if you're thinking about, uh, thinking about the jealousy that comes with the job hunt in CS uh, in CS, I'd recommend taking, thinking about what you're, what you're in CS for and 
try, and reflecting on whether you're happy with the progress you've made thus far. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. And just to add on to that, and then I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> but, but I think um, co-op is often used for a bunch of different things. It's not always just like get to Cali. Um, it's, you know, you can use it to see like, hey, let's try out different company sizes. Let's see how I like different companies, different fields, um, different roles. Like, you know, you might switch to be a designer, you might switch to be a PM. And it's like, it's all a learning progress. And I think that at the end of the day might be more beneficial than like, um, you know, tunnel visioning on like a bunch of uh, Cali or bus goals. Um, but of course, we as <laughs> CS Club, we are here to support your goals and we're, we're here to help you with your job search, no matter uh, what it is. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, that basically sums up our lecture for today. And we hope that everyone learned something new and thank you for tuning in. Our next event will take place a few weeks from now and will be a complete walkthrough of a tech interview preparing you for your next interview. So be sure to come to that. In the meantime, check out techintern.io to help you get your next job, as well as bit.ly slash uwcsclub-offline-review to get your resume critiqued. Links are up there. <laughs> and check out our link tree for these resources. And that's it. Goodbye. <laughs>